Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're already excited. The worship, wonderful, to be brought into your presence in that way. In such a free and an open way where we know you love us and we pour out our hearts to you. And for these reports that we've heard, Lord, we thank you for each one sharing. We thank you for each one here. We do pray that you'd pour out a special blessing this week on all these kids who are here, change their lives, and may many decisions for Jesus Christ be the result on Friday. And now, Lord, as we just open up your word and consider it and study it together, we open up our hearts to you, our minds to you, our lives to you. Penetrate, Lord. Some of us have heard studies on Ephesians, going through the Bible many, many times. Make it fresh. Break fresh your bread of life to us that we might grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Truth doesn't always matter to people, even when it's presented very blatantly. Example, I brought with me a cigarette box, not because I'm a smoker, because I picked it up in England. Some of you were wondering as you saw me bring this in tonight, I know. But this was, uh, I found it in, on a street in uh, England, the UK, and it's got some very interesting letters on it. Not only does it say the name brand of the cigarettes, but in large letters it says, Smokers Die Younger. It's a very blatant warning on the front. Smokers die younger. And then on the other side, smoking seriously harms you and others around you. So it's interesting to see people go into the store and pick these things up and smoke them, disregarding the blatant truth that's on the label. Smokers die younger. You're going to hurt yourself. You're hurting people around you. Well, England and Scotland are also full of churches. Full of truth, you might say. At the front of every church is a large Bible. It's often opened up. There's banners with words written in many of these churches that have been there for generations. But largely, that blatant truth has been disregarded and passed over. And many of those churches in that country are dead. If you go to downtown Glasgow, this, the city saying that used to be in all of the lampposts, written everywhere in the city were these words, let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of his word and by the praising of his name. As the years went by, they took off the last part. And now the sign just reads, let Glasgow flourish. But there's no preaching of his word and no praising of his name. And it's become a very vile, violent city. Smokers, I have noticed, especially in airports, they congregate together. They, they sort of have to because now there's rooms in airports that's just for smokers and they'll all gather inside, close the door and light up and sort of have their own little fellowship. Um, as they congregate, once again, they're ignoring the message of the harm. Professing believers can also congregate together and do so frequently and have the truth and read the word and sing the songs and know the truth, but ignore it. Now, the church at Ephesus eventually had that problem because we're going to read the book of Ephesians, but we're going to keep something in mind that was written by the Lord Jesus Christ to the church of Ephesus through the apostle John in the book of Revelation. When after a period of years, this very alive and vibrant church became a decaying church, one that had left its first love. But back to the book of Ephesians. It has a theme. I'd call it the new society, how God is building a new society of love and fellowship with his people. New life comes into Jew and Gentile, the new life produces a new relationship with a new standard. 
But what is essential for that new life and growing in that new life is hearing the truth and heeding the truth. Reading it or hearing it and then heeding it, listening to it and growing in it. Tonight we're just going to give you a few verses in Ephesians chapter 1 as an introduction and then go through it verse by verse in the next several weeks together. But I want to tell you a little bit about Ephesus. It, it was at one time the capital of Asia Minor. Now today it's just a little outpost in Turkey right off the coast. And usually tour groups that want to visit that area will stop off the coast. I remember doing it. And you take vans in or buses in and you go see the ruins of Ephesus. But at one time, it was the capital of Asia Minor. It was a wealthy city on the trade routes from west to east and east to west. A major port. It had an interesting history. If you go back about 2,000 years ago, it was settled by a group from Asia who developed the country and spread out its borders. It became very influential. Then about 1100 BC, a group from Athens came in. The Athenians, they developed it, assimilated the culture into their own culture, and then spread that primitive Greek influence around that part of Asia Minor. Then, much later on, about 133 BC, the Romans came in and conquered it. And when they did, that's when things began to prosper. Between the first and the second century, Ephesus became a world-renowned powerhouse of wealth, riches, commerce, influence. At the time that Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, there were about 500,000 people living in Ephesus, a growing, thriving town where the Roman governor of the part of Asia Minor, that province, resided. Now, Paul visited Ephesus a couple times. First time he didn't stay long, but a work was established. The second time he came on his second missionary journey, he decided to sort of dig in roots, stay planted there for a while. He spent three years teaching in the school of Tyrannus, teaching them through the scriptures. After he did that, he left again, and his last visit to Ephesus was as he was swinging back from Macedonia on the way to Jerusalem because he wanted to go to Jerusalem for one last time to give a witness. He had the elders of Ephesus meet with him not far from Ephesus on the beach, on the shores of Miletus. That's where he gathered these men together and said, I've given you the full counsel of God. I've taught you through the word of God. I've coveted no man's silver, gold, or apparel. And he warned them of wolves that would come in and destroy the sheep. But then he said, you're not going to see my face anymore. I'm departing. I'm leaving. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, even though I know the chains and persecution await me. I don't even count my life dear to myself. I want to finish my course with joy. They hugged. They wept. And that was the last time Paul saw their faces. He went to Jerusalem. He was arrested. And eventually he made his way to Rome. And that's where probably Paul wrote this letter from. A Roman prison. Now, um, I mentioned that eventually the church of Ephesus suffered decay. It's indicated by what Jesus wrote to them. In Revelation chapter 2. You have left your first love. I know your works, your labor of love, your patience. You can't stand those who are evil. But you have left your first love. So very quickly after the church was founded, within 25 to 30 years, it was already starting to decay from its original intention. So soon. So Jesus wrote that, that letter. Church historian by the name of Eusebius tells us that the Apostle John finished out his last years in the city of Ephesus, and he spent most of his time warning them against false doctrine, heresies that were spreading so quickly through that part of the world. Then by around the uh, 3rd century, 263, when it was conquered by the Goths, nothing was left of it, no church remained, and the city itself was left desolate. If you ever get to go to Ephesus, however, it's really cool. From an archaeological standpoint, only about 25% of the city has been uncovered, but it's amazing. Uh, you can stand on the street that Paul walked down 
all mosaic. On one side, your left-hand side as you're walking downtown, is the Agora, that great marketplace where they sold just about anything you wanted at that time. On your right-hand side would be the temple to Hadrian. And then you go down a little bit further and you'd have the Odeon, the theater. You go down a little bit further, right in front of you is a huge library called the Library of Celsus. You hang a right and go down the street, and to your right from that point is a theater that seats over 20,000 people. And that's where Paul gave his great testimony there in Ephesus in Acts chapters 19 and 20. So maybe someday we'll go over there. It's a great place to go visit, and uh, you'll see it all. But in the meantime, let's read the few verses of Ephesians before us. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed or blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. One thing I failed to tell you is that we know Ephesus from the book of Ephesians. That sticks in our mind as what it's famous for. This letter was written to it. But back in those days, what it was most famous for was a huge temple to a false goddess by the name of Diana. That was her name, her Roman name. Her Greek name was Artemis. It was one of the seven wonders of the world. It took 244 years to build it. And it was four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. If you've ever seen that, it's this amazing, complex structure of buildings. Four times the size. Artemis was sort of the patron goddess of young girls. She was worshipped in nature. Uh, when young girls came of age, they would give their maiden garment as well as a lock of their hair to this goddess in an offering. As the saying goes, Diana fell out of heaven and came to the earth. And they had a statue that they claimed fell out of heaven. By the way, she was depicted as the ultimate woman having many breasts. It's a grotesque figurine. If you've ever seen one of the pictures of Diana, you look at it and go, how on earth would they worship that? Now, when Paul the Apostle came into town and persuaded many of them to come to Christ, this upset a lot of the people who their system of worship was now different. It was shaken. And so they cried out for two hours in rage, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And here's the text in Acts 19. They cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, of whose image fell down from Zeus? That's what they believed in. It was a very pagan town, a very needful town, needed to hear the gospel. Sort of like Orange County. This county needs to hear the truth, needs to hear the gospel. Oh, but there's churches everywhere. Yeah, there's churches all over America. But I'm convinced still America hasn't, in a lot of cases, heard the gospel. Oh, they've heard a lot about churches. They've heard a lot about activities, but they need to hear about Jesus. And that's where we get fed and nurtured, and then we go out. Okay, Paul the Apostle was put in jail. But his prison imprisonment was a little bit different. He was in a Roman enclosure, but he could have visitors. He was kept in his own rented house, the Bible tells us in Acts, for two years. Which means, here's the picture. Picture Paul chained on either side by a praetorian sentinel, the elite guard of Rome. He's guarded in chains, but people can come in and visit him. 
Can you imagine what it would be like to be chained to the Apostle Paul for six hours at a time and hearing all the things that he would tell his visitors about Jesus, about how the churches are going, and these guys couldn't escape. It was their duty. Not only was he chained to them, they were chained to him. He truly had a captive audience. <laughs> but eventually, some of them got saved. And in the book of Philip, uh, the book to the Philippians, the letter to the Philippians, Paul writes of many of those in Caesar's household coming to the faith. So it was, it was just, he saw it as a cool witnessing opportunity. Well, one of those visitors was a guy by the name of Tychicus, who evidently came from Ephesus. And Paul, he listened to Paul, and Paul listened to him. A church had been established. Paul wrote a letter, probably dictated it to an amanuensis, somebody who would write it down for him. And then he gave that letter to Tychicus. Tychicus brought it back. I want you to look at chapter 6 of Ephesians, just so we get that framed, and then we'll, uh, we'll hop back. Verse 21, Ephesians chapter 6. But that you may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs, that he may comfort your hearts. So there's the picture. Paul in prison, writing this letter, dictating it. Tychicus takes it, and they read it to those in Ephesus. What's the theme of the book? By the way, again, this is just introductory, so, so we don't have to, we, we can go as, as long or as short as we want. The time's up, we'll just stop. The theme of the book is the new society, the new culture, the new people that Jesus Christ is creating. There's a term for it he uses over and over again in this book. It's called mystery. We see it in chapter 1, verse 9. We see it in chapter 2, chapter 3. He develops the idea of the mystery. Now, don't have in your mind a mystery as an unsolvable kind of an issue. All a mystery means in the New Testament is something that was once hidden, but now is revealed. In the Old Testament, it was com kept completely hidden. Nobody knew what it was. In the New Testament, it was unveiled. That's what the mystery was. And what was the mystery? That God would take Jew and non-Jew, people like Paul, radical rabbis, and people who worship Diana of the Ephesians, and with the same blood of his son, save them and bring them together in one church. So there wasn't male, female, Scythian, barbarian, bond, free, Jew, Gentile, black, white, upper class, lower class, class, just one family in Christ. That's the mystery. The family, the new society. That's the theme of the book. This is how Paul writes. Chapters 1 through 3 are doctrinal. Chapters 4, 5, and 6, the last half, are applicational. That's his style. Almost all of his letters follow that pattern. He lays a foundation of truth. Then there's going to come a point where he applies all of that truth. Let me break it down further for you. Three words. Wealth, walk, and warfare of the believer. You're going to find out your wealth, who you are in Christ, what you are in Christ. And by the way, the term in Christ is mentioned 27 times in this letter. Three or four times in verses 1 through 7. I say three or four because the term in the beloved, I believe, refers to in Christ. Some people don't, so it's either three or four. The wealth, the walk of the believer, once you know who you are in Christ and what you have, this is how you're to live. And then the warfare. Once you know what you have and who you are in Christ, and once you decide to live like that, you're going to be a target. The devil's going to be after you. You're not going to go skating by. If you say, in Jesus' name, I'm going to obey him and live my life for Christ, do you think hell's going to give you a standing ovation? No, you're going to be a target. So you're going to learn in this book how to grow, how to walk, and how to fight. The good Christian fight. The warfare of the believer. Now, tonight, our theme is our, our riches in Christ. And by the way, just another aside note, um, the biggest banks in Asia Minor were in Ephesus. It was the depository for ancient wealth. It's important because Paul uses um, terms that come from the banking industry, inheritance, 
fullness, and filled. These are words that come in their original language from that world. Have you ever been to an ATM? I don't know if you've had this experience. You put the card in, you put your code in, and then a little message comes up. Cannot process request insufficient funds. You go, what do you mean insufficient funds? And you're kind of bugged. Or you write a check. Check didn't go through. And you think, why doesn't my check go through? I've got 20 checks left in the book. <laughs> yeah, but there's nothing backing it up. It's no fun not to have money when you want it, but I think it's even worse to have unlimited wealth at your disposal and never use it. That's where Ephesians comes in. Who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ and so many believers don't know it and don't take advantage of it because they never open up the account book and see it and apply it and live it. Back in the early 1900s, there was a gal by the name of Hetty, H-E-T-T-Y, Hetty Green. She was nicknamed America's Greatest Miser. She died in 1916. Her estate at that time was worth over $100 million. Yet, when they found her, she had lived in squalor and in poverty. They said that she only ate cold oatmeal because she couldn't bear paying the money to heat the water. When her son got a severe leg injury, she spent her time looking around the city of New York for a free clinic. She waited too long, and when she found the free clinic, they had to amputate his leg because of an advanced infection. Cheap. She had unlimited wealth. A miser. Now, Ephesians is written to some Christians who might not realize how much is really in their bank account. And so the first part, the next couple weeks, few weeks, we're going to look at our bank book. We're going to open up our account and look inside and see what is ours. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. He calls himself an apostle by the will of God. Question, how did he know? How did he know that he was an apostle by the will of God? Did he just decide one day, I'm going to ha hang out a shingle? I am an apostle. I like the sound of that word. The word apostolos means one who is sent out on a mission. How did he know he was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God? Well, because he had a unique experience. He used to be an apostle of Judaism. A guy who did not like or believe in Jesus Christ as Messiah. He was on a trip one time from headquarters, Jerusalem, going 160 miles north to Damascus. You know the story. God got his attention. He's on his back looking up to the sky. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he asked a very important question. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then he asked the second most important question anybody should ask after, Who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do? That question began his discipleship, his apostleship as an apostle by the will of God. Because right after that, he went into Damascus. He met with a man who gave him further instruction. And he knew by that conversion and by that experience that he was called as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Upon conversion, he asked for instruction. I wonder if you've ever gotten around to asking that question about your own life. Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, many Christians live unproductive lives simply because they've never asked the question. Lord, I'm yours. You bought me. What is it you want me to do? Paul didn't choose his occupation, nor did a church in Ephesus or Philippi or Thessalonica, choose his occupation. The Lord Jesus chose his occupation. And it's wonderful to know who you are by the will of God. Skip, a pastor by the will of God. I love what one little girl used to call me at my church. She didn't get pastor right. She said, Spaster, skip. <laughs> Spaster, skip. And I said, you know, I think you got something there. 
Mary, a secretary, by the will of God. John, an accountant, by the will of God. Doesn't matter what you do. What matters is you realize, I am who I am. I do what I do because that's what God wants me to do. There's tremendous freedom in that. And I think that's the guide for living. No matter what what you're going through tonight, even if your life is in shambles, even if you're in debt, you might be a single mom, you just went through a divorce, your life is in a mess, and you wonder, how could I ever be in the will of God? Well, from this point onward, you ask, Lord, what do you want me to do? And God will show you. There's freedom in that. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, notice this, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. One of the most misunderstood words in the Bible is found in that verse. Saints. I grew up hearing that term a lot. And doing this a lot. And praying to statues a lot. Those were saints. Now, if you were to look up in the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, the definite edition of a saint, the modern dictionary, if you looked in an old, original one, it'd be different. But the modern Webster's Dictionary defines a saint, number one, as one officially recognized through canonization as preeminent for holiness. Definition number two, one of the spirits of the departed who are in heaven. So, put those definitions together. According to Webster, a saint is a near-perfect person now dead. A dead perfect dude. Or, or do debt, whatever. Perfect, dead. That's a saint. Not according to the Bible. According to the Bible, all of God's children, dead or alive, past or present, are saints. The term hagia simply means those who are set aside, called by God for his purpose. Not perfect, imperfect, but called saints. See, a lot of people go, well, I, I may not be a saint, but I do my best. If you're a Christian, you're a saint. If you're not a Christian, you're an ain't. There's either saints or ain'ts. That's the only two categories. It's simply another term for one of God's children. So, if, if you'd like to, you could call me Saint Skip. That would be appropriate. And it would be appropriate for me to call you Saint, whatever your names are, individually. That would be appropriate. That would be New Testament. That would be biblical. Look further at the verse. The two addresses that each saint has. To the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. The Ephesians, as well as us, have two addresses. One, Ephesus. They're in Ephesus. That's where they live. Us, San Juan Capistrano, San Clemente, Laguna Niguel, wherever. And in Christ. We are either in Adam or we're in Christ. If we're a saint, we're in Christ. If we're outside of Christ, we're in Adam, Romans chapter 5 tells us, unsaved. So according to God, we have two addresses, our earthly address and a spiritual address, and that spiritual address is either in Adam or in Christ. Paul's address was in Christ. But we also have a physical address. In whatever town we live in, in whatever county we live in, whatever state, whatever country, we have a dual citizenship and thus a dual responsibility to fulfill our duty as a heavenly citizen as well as an earthly citizen. It's walking that balance between earthly citizenship and heavenly citizenship, both realms. You see, Jesus, you remember when he prayed in John 17, he was praying for his disciples. He said, Father, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. I pray that you'd keep them from the evil one while they're in the world. I've always loved that prayer. He didn't say, Father, help them find hideaways, caves, where they can store up wealth and store up food and, and get prepared for Y2K or whatever might happen. It is the will of God, it's his insistence that we live side by side with all of the paganism and all of the filth that surrounds us in this world. Because he wants us to be a witness, a light to shine in a dark place, in Christ, in Ephesus. I remember in the Jesus movement, speaking of Daniel Amos, I was uh, going to college at the time, and uh, I remember a lot of people from church uh, saying, you're going to college? Why? 
Jesus is coming back before you graduate. You'll never make it through. What a waste of time. And I said, if Jesus comes back before I graduate, guess what? He'll find me in college. Witnessing to people who may not come to church, but they'll only come to college. That is their church. God needs witnesses there too. He said, occupy till I come. So that dual citizenship, be responsible here on earth as well as being prepared for heaven. And it says the faithful who are in Christ Jesus. Now there's a further description of a saint. A saint, a child of God, isn't just somebody who carries a Bible, sings a song, shouts hallelujah, and feels good when they gather together. It's someone who's faithful. Faithful to Christ. Faithful to each other. Faithful to their church. Are you faithful? I'm not asking you if you're perfect, because no one is. But are you faithful to the things of the Spirit? Then verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that, Lord Jesus Christ. Title, name, mission. His title, he's the Lord. That means he's the boss. That means when he tells you to jump, you don't go, why? You say, how high? He's the boss. He's the Lord. If you don't do what he says, don't call him your Lord. That's his title. His name, Jesus, Yeshua. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Some people have thought that. That, you know, it's like the Christ family in Nazareth and Jesus was one of the boys. No, Christ is his mission. Christos is the Greek for Mashiach, Messiah, the one sent to be the Messiah of the world. So title, name, mission, Lord Jesus Christ. I love how Paul writes his letters. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't sign them Paul at the end. He includes his name in the beginning. And uh, you, you know who's writing it. And he always gives a salutation. And it's all, almost always the same. Grace and peace be to you, or grace multiplied unto you. But what Paul does is something that's interesting. If you were to look up ancient documents, um, papyri from Rome or from Greece or from uh, er areas of the Middle East thousands of years ago, you'd find a similar salutation in every one. But what Paul does is a little bit differently. He combines two different salutations, and then he tweaks them. This is what I mean. He uses the common Greek greeting for rejoice, charis or kare, which means rejoice or grace. And then he uses a Jewish greeting translated into Greek, irene, which is the Greek equivalent for the Hebrew shalom, peace. So the Western greeting grace, rejoice, the Jewish greeting, shalom, peace. It's beautiful because Paul's theme of the book is bringing Gentile and Jew together. That's the mystery unfolded. And it's even in his salutation. He's taking the Greek pagan, the Jewish shalom, bringing them together and giving a greeting. And by the way, when Paul writes these salutations, it's always the same. Grace is always first, peace is always second. You can never reverse the order. You know why? You'll never experience the peace of God until you understand and experience the grace of God. The grace of God must deal with sin so that we as sinners can experience his peace. Hence the salutation, grace and peace, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God is in the business of blessing people. He's a blessing God. That's his nature. John's put it this way, God is love. Now, that doesn't mean God will give you everything you ever want. You can throw a tantrum anytime and claim it in Jesus' name and expect to have it because Father knows best. And Father knowing best knows that everything we ask for isn't always beneficial to us or helpful. So sometimes we'll ask and we'll beg and God will go, no. Why? Because I love you. Just like you didn't give your child everything he asked for. My son would have loved to have the keys to the car when he was 12. And now he could beg and beg, and if I was a good father, I wouldn't go, okay. I'd say no, because I love you too much. But God is a God of blessing. He loves to bless his children. 
for what's best for us. But notice the term spiritual blessing. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessings, things that pertain to the inner man, our spirit, which a lot of times we take for granted. You know, I hear Christians talk about how God blesses them, and often it's confined to the physical blessings. And it's fine. God loves to bless us in every area. But unfortunately, we don't think much about spiritual blessings. We're thinking about God bless me with a car, God bless me with a home, God bless me with a job, God bless me with health, and yes, truly, they are blessings. But I've known people that have jobs and health and wealth and all the other stuff, and they're not experiencing blessedness. They're not fulfilled, they're not happy, they're miserable. This is what David wrote in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Number one on the list, who forgives all of your iniquities. The deepest part of you is the spiritual, not the physical. God has put eternity in our hearts, Solomon said. He has fashioned us to be dissatisfied with anything short of a spiritual dimension that is fulfilled in Christ. We will be miserable until we are settled in him. St. Augustine put it this way, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Some people regard these verses as the most difficult in all of Scripture. A little bit about Paul's writing. He was complex. He did string thoughts together, long thoughts off participles. I'm not going to get into that, but he just did that. It was a complex system of writing. And so sometimes when it's translated, we read it and we go, what exactly is he saying? Let me give you uh, uh, from this five items that are in your bank account, okay? Five items that are in your bank account from these verses, and this is where we'll close. Number one, God chose us. Number two, God adopted us, verse 5. Uh, number three, God accepted us, verse 6. Number four, God redeemed us, verse 7. And also in verse 7, God forgave us. Those are the five items in your bank account, and we'll discuss those, and then we'll close. We'll pray together. First of all, God chose us. That bugs some people. Some people get bothered and debate in theology classes, God's sovereign election. Now, wait a minute. If God has given us the capacity, his creatures, to choose, why should we be upset if God makes a choice? I'm just excited God chose me. I'm not bothered by it. I love it. I'm on his team. Are you? Then you ought to be very excited about it. God has chosen us. God has the right to make choices. I love what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, It's a good thing God chose me before I was born. He surely never would have chosen me afterwards. <laughs> well, that might be funny, but it's not that true because it says we were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. Think of Jesus choosing his disciples. Did Jesus know that Peter would betray him? Mm hmm, before he chose him, but he chose him. Did he know that Thomas would doubt him? Yep. Did he know that Judas would sell him out? Yep. But he chose him anyway. In advance, knowing that, he even predicted it a couple of different times. Yet he chose them before it happened. So are we imperfect? Yes. Has God chosen us? Yes. Does God knew that you, uh, uh, did God know in advance that you would fail like you've fallen this week? Mm-hmm. Does it surprise him? Uh-uh. It's called grace. That doesn't mean you go on every week. Oh, well, whatever, it's grace. There has to be the change of lifestyle according to the wealth that we've received, the walk. We'll get to that. But God knew it, and God chose you. About 1,500 years ago, in the city of Florence, Italy, 
artists were everywhere. Great artisans, great painters, great sculptors. There was a story of a block of marble that was sent from the famous quarries in Carrara, Italy, and shipped to Florence to be inspected and then used by some famous sculptor. Well, it was brought there. Donatello, the famous Italian Florentine sculptor, looked at it, and he rejected it because he saw a crack running through it. Uh, Other artists looked at it, rejected it. Others rejected it. Finally, one came And he said of this flawed block of marble, there's an angel that lives within, and I must get it out. His name was Michelangelo. And his statue, David, is still adorning the courtyard over there in Florence. Beautiful statue. His masterpiece. Michelangelo saw the potential in the flawed block of marble that the other artist didn't see. And I submit to you, that's our artist. God knows what he has to work with. He didn't say, wow, you amaze me. He knows us. But he chose us, even though he knows us, with all of the flaws, and he sees the potential in your life. He sees not just who you've been, not just who you are, but what he can make you from this day forward. That's what he has in mind. So he has chosen us in Christ. And he's chosen us before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This this also bothers people, that, that God can choose us before we were ever born. How could God ever choose people before they had a chance to choose him? I'm not going to solve the riddle, but I'm going to give you a word that helps. Foreknowledge. God has an attribute you and I don't have. It's called foreknowledge. He happens to know everything before it happens. He's not learning. He never goes to school. There's no limited knowledge of God. He knows absolutely everything in advance. And he knows who's going to choose him in advance. And so it says in Psalm 90, we spend our years as a tale that has been told. And Peter writes, 1 Peter 1 verse 2, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Picture it this way. You're walking down a hallway. You see several doors. You could choose anyone to go through, but you see one sign on a door that says, come. It's an invitation for you to come. It says, whosoever will, let him come. You open the door because you chose to go in. Then you see a big banquet table spread before you, and lo and behold, your name written on a name tag at the play setting. And you think, wait a minute, they knew I was going to come? And then the door closes behind you, and you see another sign on the inside. This time it's written, chosen in Christ before the foundations of the earth. Well, wait a minute, I I made the choice. Yeah, you did, but God knew you'd make the choice. God God chose you, he told the disciples. I chose you, and I ordained you. Now, some people hear that, and they say, that's not fair. Why isn't it fair? Well, maybe God didn't choose me. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll prove that God did choose you. Choose you. How? You choose him right now, and you'll discover that God had already chosen you before the foundations of the earth. (laughs) Well, I don't want to choose God. Well, why not? I don't know if I believe or not. Well, then don't blame God. Because if you choose him, you'll find out you've been chosen in Christ. Whosoever will, let him come. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I don't want to. Maybe you're not chosen then. But the choice is up to you. That's why the Bible sets before us the sovereignty of God, but the choice and free will of man. So God chose us. Number two, God adopted us. Uh, It refers to being an adult son. We'll probably get more into that because it's mentioned a little bit later. God accepted us. Uh, Look at it in verse 6. To the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Here's the point. You can't clean up your own act and make yourself acceptable to God. He accepts you. By the way, I don't want to get hung up on the terminology, but a lot of times we say, have you accepted Christ? You know what? You don't accept him. He accepts you. Oh, you receive him 
as your Lord and Savior. But it's not like, well, here am I. I'm the judge of the universe. I accept Christ. No, no. He will accept you under one condition, that you come and believe in him, you turn from your sins, you give your life to him. That's the, that's the way you come. And he'll accept you based upon his finished work. He'll make you acceptable. Then he's redeemed us. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. That's the word from the slave market to buy back. Six million slaves in the Roman Empire at that time. Six million slaves. People would buy and sell men and women and children like cattle. But sometimes a slave could be purchased and then you could give that slave its freedom. Jesus, by his blood, freed us. And now Paul says, Romans chapter 6, we're his slaves, which is the freest way to live when we're free from the bondage of sin and death. And then finally, we close with this, forgiveness. In him we have redemption, verse 7, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. How does God forgive you? By laying on Jesus everything you and I have ever done. God treated Jesus like you deserve to be treated so that God could treat you like Jesus deserves to be treated. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Beautiful promise of forgiveness. Your riches in Christ. Hey, your account's full, man. You are rich in Christ. Spiritual riches. Do you ever stop and just thank God for those spiritual riches? Yeah, but I don't have that new car. <laughs> yeah, I know. And Okay, let's pray for that. It could be a legitimate need. But here's, here's the big one. You're not going to hell. You're saved. You're saved if you know Christ, if you're in him. And listen, think about it. If he never fulfilled any other promise than that, you're rich. You're rich because of that. The Hebrews have a term for this. I'm going to share it with you tonight. It'll become sort of our little secret. Dayenu. Dayenu. Can you say that? Dayenu. It means in Hebrew, it's enough. And what they do every Passover, it's a beautiful exercise, is they recite what God has done, and then together in the Passover they say, Dayenu, they say, it's, it would have been enough. And this is how it goes. The person leading the Passover will say, If he merely rescued us from Egypt but had not punished the Egyptians, Dayenu. If he had merely punished the Egyptians but had not destroyed their gods, Dayenu. If he had merely destroyed their gods but had not slain their firstborn. If he had merely slain their firstborns but had not given us their property. Dayenu. If he had merely given us their property but had not split the sea for us. Dayenu. If he had merely split the sea for us but had not brought us through on dry ground. Dayenu. If he had merely brought us through on dry ground but not drowned our oppressors. Dayenu. Would have been enough. If he had merely drowned the oppressors but not supplied us in the desert for 40 years, die new. If he had merely supplied us in the desert for 40 years but not fed us with manna, die new. If he had merely fed us with manna but not given us the Sabbath, die new. If he had merely given us the Sabbath but not brought us to Mount Sinai, die new. If he had merely brought us to Mount Sinai but not given us the Torah, die new. If he had merely given us the Torah but had not brought us to the land of Israel, die new. If he had merely brought us to the land of Israel but had not built us the temple, die new. And I would add to that, if the Lord provided salvation through Jesus Christ and nothing more, die new. It would have been enough. But... He did more than just save you. Romans 8.32, it says, He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Wow. 
We have no complaints, do we? Die new. There's no second-class Christians, no deprived citizens. We're all rich in him. Heavenly Father, thank you for these first seven verses of a fabulous, fabulous letter inspired by your spirit given to an apostle, one sent, one who knew he was called by the will of God, one who gave the gospel to those who were chained with him, to those who came to visit him, to anyone he could, whether in the large city of Ephesus surrounded by paganism or to the most religious person that he came in contact with. Lord, give us a heart, a same heart for the gospel. Thank you for your salvation. Lord, we would just pray for anyone who might be here tonight as we're praying, who's unsettled, uncertain, and hasn't given their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Or maybe they did so long ago or they never really followed up on it. They've backslidden and they need to come back to you and make it real. We pray, Lord, that you'd bring them to that place of safety and rest tonight. And as we're praying right now, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ in a personal and real way, in a sincere and authentic way. Or maybe you've backslidden. You want to come back to him and make certain that you're going to go to heaven. I want you to raise your hand right now where you're sitting. Just raise it up. I'll notice your hand and I'll, I'll pray for you before we close. God bless you right up here in the front and over to my left and in the back. Anybody else? Anyone else? Just raise it up. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Yes, sir. In the back. Heavenly Father, thank you for this. Thank you for these. We all lift our hearts in joy for each one and pray that you'd bring them to just a place of great rest because you dealt with their sins as they give their lives to you. Make them feel accepted in the beloved, part of your family, our family. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. As we stand, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you just for a moment not to leave, not to move around. But if you raise your hand.